afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Suburban Proletarian. My name is Greg, and today is March 29th, 2020. And wow, it's been three weeks since I posted my last video thereabouts. And in the intervening time, the world has turned upside down, or at least our world has turned upside down. Um, as I'm sure most of you know, I hope, I don't expect that this is going to be a video that garners uh, tens of thousands of views overnight, so I think there's a pretty good chance that most of you are going to be watching this months or weeks, at least months, uh, possibly years in the future. You might be looking back on what we're going through right now uh, in hindsight, and uh, I really envy you for that. So. Uh, I am here to talk about a Soviet stopwatch, which I just got in. It's really more of an unboxing than anything. And I know uh, it annoys some of you to no end when I blather on. So I just want you to know today I'm going to be doing some blathering on. So for those of you who are just here to see the watch, go ahead, scroll through down below until you see me hold the package up once again. And that's when we'll get down to business. All right, for the rest of you who have hung in here, um, I just want to talk for a few minutes, sort of outside the purview of what we normally talk about here on the channel. Uh, and I'd like to preface this by saying, first of all, I'm not a virologist. I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not an immunologist. I'm not any type of ologist. My views that I express here today are just uh, those that I've come to through logical musing of the situation that we're in. Um, and I don't know if I should even be talking about this today, but I personally have been through several stages um, of this pandemic, uh, sort of like the separate stages of grief, you know. Uh, not that I'm feeling grief, but I've gone through um, outright panic, or in the beginning, it was almost a very surreal feeling where I, I, I literally wondered to myself if I was in the middle of a, some strange, bizarre nightmare that I would suddenly wake up from and everything would be back to normal, which obviously at this point, that's not the case. I've gone through uh, panic. I've gone through uh, extreme anxiety that lasted all day long. I've gone through days of pretty deep depression. I'm not claiming to be clinically depressed or anything like that, but I've had days that seemed really bleak in the last couple of weeks. And I know that some of you might still be feeling that way. Somebody who watches this might still be feeling that way. And I don't have a very big platform. Uh, my last video, which was such a huge contrast, we were getting ready to go out to dinner and I was celebrating the fact that I had 500 subscribers just three weeks ago, was a completely different tone than today's video, although I'm, I'm feeling pretty upbeat, actually. Um, but if I can help somebody out there um, with just a little bit of logic, because I know that I have a tendency to hear a report or hear a story on the news, something that's presented as definitive fact, and I seize on that and I obsess on that and, you know, it can, it can instill feelings of doom in you that we're in a hopeless situation. And I just want to make the point, if I can, to one or two people that we are not necessarily in a hopeless situation. In fact, I don't think anybody really knows what the outcome of this is going to be. It is certainly serious. We certainly need to take precautions. Um, but I know some of you out there might be obsessing about a news story you've heard. And I would just like to say that, uh, although I'm not an expert, in the last three or four days, I have seen on television, uh, heard, reported on the radio, I have read articles um, that were supposedly based, some of them were actually being presented by doctors, others were based on the presentations of doctors or the empirical data that was being put forth. Um, and these were all presented as indisputable fact. And I'd just like to show you right now that they can't possibly all be indisputable fact. I have seen said in the last uh, couple of days just about the behavior of this virus. Let's just look at that. 
that it is very, very um, prone to mutate rapidly. It's what they call slippery, and it can change its genetic profile very quickly. And some doctors have made the statement that that is extremely dangerous because it's going to make it much more difficult for us to develop a vaccine, uh, to pin down the virus and develop an effective vaccine that'll have long lasting effects. Other doctors have said, well, yes, it, it uh, mutates very rapidly and very unpredictably, but as makes evolutionary sense, as it mutates, as with most other viruses, it has a tendency to become less and less and less deadly. That makes perfect um, evolutionary sense. You know, if you kill fewer of your victims uh, as you evolve, the longer you can sort of perpetuate your line and the more successfully you can spread. And eventually the uh, virus will just evolve into something akin to the common cold, which seems to be the case already with some people. Uh, and it'll spread through the population and everybody will get a little bit sick and then we'll develop an immunity and it'll go away. So those are two, uh, two assessments based on how rapidly the, uh, the, the virus can mutate. Then I've seen also presented in the last couple of days, well, the, vi the virus really hasn't mutated to any great degree. Um, it pretty much behaves exactly the same wherever it crops up. And that's terrible, according to some doctors, because it's basically killing the same number of people wherever it pops up, and it's very deadly, and it's very dangerous, and it's very bad, which certainly it has been very bad. I'm not sure that the data, or at least the data I'm seeing online, really necessarily bears that out. Um, there are, of course, a lot of factors with something like this uh, relating to the level of health care and the level of uh, government intervention and social distancing and all of that. Um, but the mortality rates in different areas seem to be dramatically different. So I'm not sure that that's necessarily the case, but that is the assertion of some doctors. It's not mutating, it's staying deadly, and this is very, very bad. Then there's still yet other doctors saying, well, it's not mutating very quickly at all. But that's a good thing because it's going to uh, greatly increase the speed at which we can develop a definitive vaccine. We can nail this virus down, get the population vaccinated, everyone will develop an immunity, and the virus will go away. So I don't know if any one of those is true. What I do know is that they can't all possibly be true, not every single one of them. And they've all been presented to me as immutable facts. You know, this is how it's going to go. And we just don't really know. So I guess the short version of this, or, or what I'm trying to get down to is, I think it's very important uh, for all of us, and for you especially, if you're feeling hopeless in the middle of this situation, to focus on the things that all doctors agree on and all uh, public health officials are telling us to do. That's social distancing. And by social distancing, I think that's a really bad phrase. My dad made a point to me this morning that a reverend friend of his had said he would much prefer to see the term um, uh, physical distancing or proximal distancing because uh, I think for a lot of people, social distancing isn't great. Uh, we feel isolated already. We feel sometimes hopeless, and it helps to be able to socialize. And we're living in this wonderful technological age where we can communicate across long distances. Uh, so if you have the opportunity to reach out to somebody who might be isolated using uh, a safe method, electronic means, absolutely go ahead and do that. But and, and try to stay as home as much as possible. If you must go out into public, you know, use that proximal distancing. Keep six feet away from people. If you feel ridiculous wearing a mask in public, I can tell you that, that, that feeling ridiculous is a lot better than catching the virus or more importantly, spreading the virus if you're already carrying it unknowingly. Uh, paper masks or even anything, if you don't have paper masks, 
put a bandana over your face or a scarf or something like that. If you're carrying it and you cough, you're greatly reducing the chances of spreading that to other people. And of course, when you're out in public, wash your hands, wash your damn hands, carry a bottle of hand sanitizer in your pocket, sanitize frequently if you can, uh, and avoid touching your face in public. These are all solid things that everybody agrees on. And if we all do our part, we as a society are going to get through this. Um, I have no doubt of that. And I really don't believe in my heart that the worst case scenarios um, are going to come true. So, so at the end of the day, I hope this has helped somebody. And let us now go on to the watch. Those of you who are scrolling, here it is. Let's go do it. All right, guys, so let's take a first look at this Slava stopwatch as it was shipped to me. This is not a proper unboxing. Obviously, I've had this open already, um, but I still want you to get an idea of how it looked when I got it. I haven't really done anything to it, uh, and I will be doing a more thorough review of the watch later on. Uh, interesting thing is it got mailed to me in a sort of three-ring binder sleeve, which makes me think, well, I'll draw a few other conclusions in a few minutes. Um, so this watch was first developed, I think, in 1960, uh, the stopwatch, and it was specifically uh, developed uh, in conjunction with the Soviet space program, uh, to be used uh, on board Soyuz spacecraft for um, timing various things like rocket burns and experiments and things like that in much the same light as our uh, Omega Speedmaster but just in the form of a handheld stopwatch. Uh, you can see here it says Slava on the uh, rather rigid uh, styrofoam box that it came in. Early examples of this watch came in a nice uh, green velvet or felt lined uh, wooden mahogany box and uh, were a little fancier but these came, uh, these later ones came, I think this one was made in 1980, um, came in these rather heavy duty styrofoam boxes uh, but this isn't just a shipping container, this is meant as a storage case. It's very, very substantial indeed. Um, and I think for the most part these things lived in their storage boxes. Um, you'll see in just a second how large this watch is. This was not something that, you know, a track coach would have hanging on a string around his neck or somebody would be carrying around in their pocket. Um, this is laboratory grade. It's meant to be used in a space capsule. It's meant to be used in a laboratory. And I think most of the time it would have lived on the shelf in this case. So anyway, we removed the lid. And one thing I thought was kind of interesting is it's very difficult to see. I cleaned the box a little bit. Um, there was a face drawn on the styrofoam, which just looked like something a bored student would do. It was, looked like it was written in ballpoint pen, and a lot of it washed off when I cleaned up the box. Um, so I suspect this watch may have started life uh, in a laboratory at a university or something, which is backed up by the sort of binder um, sleeve it was wrapped in. Um, I'm assuming, I'm guess guessing, I'm hoping it wasn't illegally liberated from, but maybe a university laboratory was not going to be using these things anymore and they were given away to students who capitalized on it by selling uh, the watch. Actually, he had a couple of them and uh, sold me one here in the United States. And uh, it's here after like three weeks of shipping. So I don't know, just speculation on my part. But once we remove the lid, um, the watch is remarkably intact. Um, much the same as with our uh, Zlataust Agat uh, stopwatch that we looked at a few weeks ago. This one has its passport. It has its date of manufactured, 19 June 1980. Um, serial number of the watch. This was very standard for sort of expensive consumer items 
during the time of the Soviet Union. Um, not sure what that says. And here's an instruction manual, also all in uh, Cyrillic Russian, so I can't read that, and there's no way I would be able to get my wife to translate it for me because she just doesn't care about this sort of stuff, but it's nice that that came. And the watch is just nested in this box here. And so this was obviously used. It's not new, but it's in very, very good condition. Um, oh, here's another interesting thing. This is a case back wrench. Each watch came with its own wrench nested in the packaging. I'll show you how that works in a little bit. Um, so the watch still has its hang tag on it uh, with the serial number and some other information stored on it which I can't read. Maybe I'll get my wife to translate that before I do the actual video of the watch. But um, you can see it's in overall very good condition. And unlike the Agat stopwatch we looked at the other week, there's, well, there's several differences. This one has three buttons, or two buttons in addition to the crown, whereas the Agat only had one button. Uh, these two controls, the crown and this button, do the exact same things that they do on the Agat. Uh, this one's a little bit different, and we'll go over that in a moment. Uh, but the watch is in very good condition. It still has most of its blue protective enamel on the back. This is not um, a decorative feature. It wasn't meant to be a permanent finish. If I took my fingernail and just scraped it across here, this would flake right off. It's just meant to protect the finish of the watch, but you can see, and it, and it doesn't really stand up to much use. It'll wear off pretty quickly, as it's intended to do. It has broken out a little bit here, but um, overall it's in pretty uh, completely intact, so that just shows that the watch hasn't seen an enormous amount of use. Uh, so what makes this watch different uh, from a standard stopwatch, other than its enormous size and weight, and that is the fact that this has a retropont feature to it, uh, and I'll show you how that works. I'll wind the watch up just a little bit. I, oh, I know it, it drives you crazy when I twist it, so we'll just go in one direction. Alright, so pressing in the crown will start the stopwatch. And you can immediately see how fast that hand is moving. And maybe if I get it up close enough to the microphone, you'll be able to hear it beeping, uh, uh, beating. It's beating at an enormously high rate. That's, uh, I think, 36,000 beats per hour, 10 beats per second. And you can see now, at this very close range, there are two second hands moving around the dial at the same time. And you can also see that it's making a full circuit in 30 seconds instead of 60 seconds. That's part of the reason of this very high beat. The reason there's two hands is the Rattrapont feature. Rattrapont in French, loosely translated, means to catch up, because you can do split times with this watch. If I press in the left hand button, one hand will stop while the other continues to move. And if I press the Rattrapont button again, the hand catches up. Hence, Rattrapont, to catch up. The uh, Rattrapont hand catches up with the main seconds hand, and I can record another split time. And you can do all kinds of stuff. If I feel like I have to stop, I can catch up. I can start them both again. I can take a split. I can stop the other seconds hand, I can reset the other seconds hand, and then reset the Rattrapont hand. Um, so this is a pretty remarkable mechanism, and when we take a closer look at the watch, I will explain it a bit more, um, but I just thought you'd like to take a quick look at it right now. Um, let me just unscrew the back very quickly so you can see what's going on inside here. 
I believe there are actually two column wheels running the chronograph uh, function inside this watch. You have one column wheel right here, which is operated by these sort of sugar nipper looking things. When I run the, the watch, see how fast that balance wheel is oscillating? You can see that the Rachapunt button operates that column wheel. The function, you can see some parts moving just in there when I start the uh, chronograph and when I stop it. I believe that is also controlled by a column wheel. That column wheel, however, is uh, covered by this piece of the bridge, I, presumably, so you can't see the second column wheel, but it's a pretty amazing piece of uh, technology right here. This is a homegrown Russian design and is remarkably elegant. So anyway, we'll go into deeper uh, detail on the internal workings of this watch and what it was designed for uh, when I do the actual review and comparison with my other Soviet stopwatch. But for the time being, let's go back over to the bookshelves and wrap this up because I'm sure this is already pretty darn long. So anyway, again, we're going to touch on that watch a little bit more in the future. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I hope some of you maybe found it helpful. If you did, please consider subscribing. It goes a long way to help keep me here on the air. Um, if you did enjoy this video and you'd like to see more like it, uh, click the, and you're already a subscriber, click the little bell icon down below. That will allow YouTube to send you notifications when I post new content to the channel. Um, if you did enjoy the video, like it, share it, tell your friends, all of those things help out. And when I post new content to the channel, as I absolutely will be doing soon, I hope to see each of you here then. Take care, be safe, wash your damn hands. Later guys.